Good evening, everyone. Um, I hope you can all hear me okay at home. Um, sorry, we're running a little bit late. Yet again, more IT problems. Um, I just got set up, ready to go, but my computer decided to crash. So in true farrier form, we're running about 20 minutes late. Um, but it's not going to be a long talk tonight. Um, just a little bit of advice and a bit of common sense, really, into what's going on at the moment. One thing I will say is <clears throat> if you could refrain from asking questions uh, to the end, because what ha generally happens with these kind of things is people ask questions and because of the delay in the streaming, etc., people get missed out and stuff. So we'll have, we'll have a bit of um, a question <clears throat> um, or certainly an opportunity to ask any questions toward the end of it. Again, this is obviously these times. Um, there's a lot of people panicking, um, and there's a lot of mixed information coming from a lot of different avenues. So, <clears throat> so I just had to turn the port down. It's not a euphemism, right? Um, okay, so. Obviously, at the moment, we've got this dreaded COVID-19. Um, the country is kind of on a lockdown situation. Obviously, some people are still moving around, as we've seen this weekend. There's a lot of people um, not following government guidelines. Uh, the key thing with it is there is this uncertain timeline. Will it go on for another three weeks? Will it go on for another three months? Nobody knows. You know, it, the situation is changing daily. Um, I know the government are probably doing the best and given the circumstances to keep us informed. Um, so how does this affect Farry and your horse? Well, you know, for a start, there's a lot of risk involved. Obviously, Farry is going from yard to yard, coming into contact with different personalities on yard, and different people, different owners. You know, most of us are washing our hands frequently and trying not to get too close. But again, I we've all witnessed it and, you know, talked to other farriers as well. They've witnessed it as well. You'll go to one yard where everything's tied up, you know, wash. Uh, people are either taking their own wash um, facilities or there's wash facilities there for you to use. Um, and everyone's keeping their distance. The next yard you turn up to, You've got six women sat in the tack room, all smoking and, and drinking cups of coffee, talking like it would be any other normal day. Um, so again, you know, why would you put yourself into that situation? Um, obviously, there's finan financial implications. Obviously, to you, the horse owner, some horse owners, for example, if you're self-employed, you know, money's a bit tight. Um, you know, so you might just be using that, that as an, you know, we'll take the shoes off, we'll save a bit of money. That's fair enough. But remember, obviously, there's financial implications to us farriers as well. <clears throat> um, and I can safely say, I mean, all the farriers I speak to, people are cutting back. They're taking shoes off where, where they can. And they are stringing things out a little bit more to make things as safe as possible. Some ain't. I've, I've spoke to and not even going out unless it's dire emergencies uh, more about that later but uh, you know there's financial implications to us um, farriers as well and you know the key thing common sense thing is what is best for your horse in this situation not what's best for you not what's best for me but what's best for your horse so just a few things we're going to talk about um oops. Right, so obviously the current situation, yes, we are in a lockdown. We should not be going out unless it's necessary. For example, if you have, I mean, okay, some of us are lucky, and I don't, when I say some of us, I don't mean myself. Some people are very lucky that they've got their stables, their arena at their house. They don't have to leave their house to go and do anything with their horse. Some of us have got our horses on, um, DIY livery yards or something like that, then 
you know, there is no one there to look after your horse for you. So you have to go. It's an animal it needs taken care of. You need to go and tend to your horse every day again, which is fair enough. There's a lot of debate at the moment whether that does mean that you could, can therefore tack it up, get on it and go and ride around the nearest two villages. You know, that's a bit of a bone of contention. Again, we'll talk about that more in a bit. Um, you know, and again, everyone's situation is individual, you know, and this goes to the situation of where you keep your horse, the environment your horse lives in, and your own, um, you know, is, is that horse, does it need to be in work? Can it be let down? Can it be turned away? Has it, you know, and when we're talking about whether we take the shoes off or not, are its feet up to it? But again, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit, you know, and these are all choices we've got to make. Um, sorry, my slides seem to have gone the wrong way around. So first of all, let's just look back at, you know, this is about whether we take the shoes off or not, let's face it. So let's just turn ourselves back. I know there's a lot of people with horses these days who <clears throat> obviously there was a horse population boom in this country about 15 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, various reasons for that to happen. Funny enough, we'll be talking about that in the, lam the, the laminitis or the, certainly the raising cases of laminitis talk um, tomorrow night. Um, but there's a lot of modern horse owners only been in and around horses for, for the last 15 to 20 years. And a lot of things have changed. Historically, obviously before mechanization, when horses were working horses, and certainly back in the days when I was a child, which was, you know, 25 years ago plus, different. There wasn't that many outdoor schools. There certainly weren't many outdoor schools with floodlights, and there certainly weren't many indoor schools. Most people who had a horse did something, and that thing had a season. Now, if you were dressage, eventer, show jumper, that was all summer stuff. At the end of your season, nine times out of ten, they just pull the horse shoes off and they'll chuck them out in the field. Um, and it's the same with working horses obviously myself got an army background with horses and um <clears throat> every year or roughly about every 12 months depending on the actual horse and what work it does but at least once a year those horses they go from london up to mount mowbray the shoes get ripped off and they get chucked out in the fields um there's one or two cases where they will leave front shoes on, but it's actually in Queen's regulations in the British Army that no horse, army horse, can be turned out with hind shoes on. That's actually written, it's a chargeable offence. Reason is obviously safety. You've got a herd of horses, they're going to start sorting out the pecking order, they're going to kick themselves. And obviously a horse with shoe on is going to do a lot more damage. But the key thing is we take all the shoes off because these working horses, their feet, when they come in from grass, what we have there, which is normally really good feet, of what we've got to keep ourselves going. And these horses are shot very regular. They're doing a lot of hard concussive work. Um, and the feet do get damaged over a period of time. Take the shoes off, turn it out in the field, give it a few months off. They come back with perfect feet. Or certainly feet a lot better than they went out with. And it was the same with a lot of old working horses. Some horses used to just carry on working all the way through all the seasons but they had a very short working life expectancy and again back in the old proper days of hunting obviously hunter shoeing the old traditional hunter shoeing quite an extreme form of shoeing not a lot of support um obviously because we don't want the shoes to get pulled off um and at the end of all all the hunting seasons at the end of the winter, beginning of spring, shoes off, chucked out in the field for the summer, allows the feet to go back to normal, grow a bit of hill, um, and they came back ready for the next season. So it's only a modern phenomena we're seeing where horses get backed and broke at the age of four, for example, they have its first set of shoes slapped on it and it gets shod every six to eight weeks for the rest of its life until it goes to the big glue factory in the sky. Um, is that good for horses' feet? Personally, I don't think it is. 
you know, I have um, over the years, I've had a lot of referral veterinary type work, horses with poor feet, where farriers were struggling to keep shoes on or just keep the condition of feet. And a lot of it was, you know, these horses all were horses which benefited from having a couple of months without the shoes on. I didn't have to do anything fancy, literally took the shoes off, turned it away, may have been a little bit sore for a week. They did break up a little bit and they looked in some cases horrendous. But then once all the damaged foot broke away and the strong stuff started growing down, they all came back with a lot of good feet, you know, and that took no remedial shoeing, no, no fancy tricks, anything like that. It's just like um, nature's green reset button. So, you know, it, it's something which used to happen annually for most horses. It's not something new we're having to do because of this emergency situation. Okay, so obviously, as far as what we do as hoof care providers, barriers, barefoot trimmers, whatever you want to call us. Okay. Um, we have two basic types of trim. Trim for shoes, trim for unshod. The only difference between the two is when we trim the foot, when it's not going to have a shoe on it, we leave a little bit more foot on it. We certainly leave a lot more sole protection because, you know, the shoe's not going to be rising off the ground, so it's going to be walking on its feet for one want of a better word um and when we finish the job up we just take the foot forward and we round up the sharp edge at the bottom make it nice and round and that that helps the uh, the hoof avoid splitting um one of the things you do notice is there is this transitional timeline so when we take the shoes off the horse when it's been shot for a period of time Again, where we place our nails, although it doesn't cause a lot of long-term damage to the horse, however, the bit we nail into, because we're driving the nails between, obviously, the um, structure which makes up the hoof, we will weaken it. So what you very often find is when we do remove the shoes, the, where the nails went, if anything's going to break away, it's normally that area. But then that's a weak area. We've made it weak by nailing. So one of the first things which is going to eject is that area. Also, if there's any other weak parts of the foot, they may split and eject as well. But what we end up growing down afterwards is a lot stronger and we will end up with a better foot. As far as, you know, and this transitional timeline, that can take anything from four to eight weeks. Depends on the horse, depends on the foot condition, depends on the environment the horse lives in. You know, if it's a hard, lumpy environment, they're going to have a lot more wear and tear to them. Whereas if it's a nice, grassy, soft, softer area, obviously we're not going to have so much wear and tear to the hoof. But again, every horse is different. What happens to a horse which is grossly overweight? Again, that's going to put more pressure on the foot and we will end up with a lot more wear and tear than a horse which is underweight. Common sense, everything we're talking about here is common sense. Additional hoof care, other than the, uh, the I call it tri trimming for grass, that's an old army saying, but um, <clears throat> obviously trimming for unshod. I'm avoiding using the word barefoot. The only reason I'm using <laughs> avoiding the word barefoot is that's a kind of phrase which has been hijacked by the barefoot trimming fraternity nothing against them you know but um from from a training point of view i just think you know farriers in this country have mainly been the hoof care thing but that's an argument for another day um as far as um additional hoof care what you can do as a horse a horse owner i mean i, I did a talk the other night and people run about all oh, do, should we get a rasp or a file so we can take away the sharp edges? I wouldn't recommend that, you know, unless you've got experience in trimming horses' feet, it's very easy to over trim this trim the hoof, over round things off, take away bits you shouldn't have taken away. Remember, you can take stuff away, but you can't put it back on. So you're best off talking to your hoof care provider um, and using their advice. 
Um, as far as lotions, potions and other things, well, there's no real need to start filling them full of various formula or any other kind of feed additive. More about feed tomorrow in the laminitis talk. Um, but there are a few products. Again, there are a lot of products on the market. I only tend to recommend stuff I've used personally because I know whether it works or not. Um, one of the only thing, uh, things on the market I found for generally toughening up the horse's feet, especially on his transitional phase when you're going from shoes to unshod, is a product called Keratex Hoof Hardener. Um, comes in a small white bottle with a blue label. Um, there are other manufacturers making something similar. I've not used them products, so I can't really give an opinion on that. But Keratex Hoof Hardener, it says hardener in the name. doesn't really harden the feet because that's not necessarily what we want, but it does improve the structural integrity of the hoof wall and just makes it tougher. Okay. But again, there's lots of different things. Everyone's got their own thing they like. Putting oils and greases on feet, I'm not a big fan of that. I don't think that um, that toughens feet up, if anything. Um, just makes them a bit softer sometimes. But again, that's for the individual. Will your horse cope unshod? And that is the real question we're asking here. Well, it's a difficult question. A lot of people have messaged me over the last couple of weeks, you know, not necessarily my clients, asking, would my horse, and they've given me a big case history of their horse. It's very difficult. I, you know, unless you know the horse, you can't really answer that. You know, and that is a question for your farrier, your hoof care provider to answer. Okay, there's lots of different, lots of different facts um, on that question. Obviously, the key thing is the actual foot quality of the horse and the condition the feet are in. And I've seen some very, very bad, um, dysfunctional, very thin, thoroughbred feet which quite frankly, the feet were that weak, they were just literally falling through the center, of the center of the shoe. I mean, think of a large toilet seat and a small bottom, which is probably, which is pretty much what a horseshoe on a foot is doing. And the, if the feet are not strong, they literally just fall through the hole in the middle. Um, and I've seen a lot of feet like that in the past where, you know, I've even questioned, even though I'm advising to take the shoes off, I've kind of questioned in my back of my head, is this the right thing? Um, and we've not had a lot of other options and we've gone down that path. And yes, the horse may have been a little bit footy for a week, um, especially when you've got yards like we've got in this country where nine times out of 10 to get from the stable door to this field, it's got to walk over stones, it's got to walk over gravel, it's got to walk over a hardcore. Well, take my shoes off, I wouldn't want to walk over that either. Um, that's why I've got carpets in my house. So obviously these feet, which are really, really poor, they've had the shoes off, they've gone out in the field, depending on the time of year, and the feet have actually, eight weeks down the line, a uh, massive improvement. So again, it depends on the quality. No one knows your horse's feet better, other than your horse, than your farrier does. He knows them feet better than you do. Okay, so he that's the person to talk to. Again, some horses out there, for example, I mean, Hovis is a great um, advocate of this. If it's had some kind of injury, well, most of you obviously are aware of what's been going on with Hovis's feet over the last two years. Um, you know, I've had some great holidays out of him, um, and I know the vets had um, a large extension of swimming pool thanks to him and his and his mother's bank balance. But Hovis, could I take Hovis's shoes off now and just turn him out for the next couple of months? No. He's had a keratoma, he's had surgery on his foot, there's a big gaping hole at the front. He needs them shoes on, whether he's in work or not, to protect that injury. Likewise, if you've got a horse who's been undergoing remedial farrowry and vet treatment for the last 12 months to alleviate either a soft tissue injury or uh, any kind of condition or pathology going on there. You don't really want to be pulling the shoes off and just chucking it out in the field and forgetting about it because you've spent a lot of money to get that horse back up and running. The last thing you want to do now is just go back to zero. 
So unless it's specifically beneficial to that horse's problem, which, you know, again, your farrier, your vet will be able to tell you that because he knows the horse. OK, um, you know, so in them circumstances, keep your shoes on, keep on going, keep on doing what you're doing. Again, environment. We're, we're obviously coming out of a very wet winter where feet have um, been quite effective. There's been a lot of what we call morphology in the sense the feet have been very soft. So if there is any conformational defects, which let's face it, most horses have got, you know, these feet have been distorting quite a bit. <clears throat> um, if you listen to the, I did um, put a link to the podcast which uh, me and a couple of other farriers had a long discussion uh, last night or yesterday evening on this hoof capsule morphology, this, these hoof capsule distortions. Um, you know, so there's a lot of interesting contact content on there, which is quite relevant to this. Um, obviously, horses that live in wet environments, they're going to have softer feet. Horses that live in drier environments, they're going to have harder feet. Obviously, we're going into the spring. We've all seen how quickly over the last 10 days the ground has dried up. If you are going to take your shoes off, now's probably the time to do it before it gets really hard. There's enough, the worst time to take your shoes off a horse is the middle of the summer, unless we're having one of those wet English summers. Okay, because if the ground is really, really hard and it just makes that transitional period between taking the shoes off and becoming um, unshod, if you like, uh, just makes that transitional period a little bit more harder to manage. Um, again, if you live, there are certain parts of the um, country, like where I'm from originally down in Kent, over on the downs there, it's, there was a lot of flint in the soil. So if all of a sudden you're taking your shoes off and you've got a lot of flint in the soil, you know, you could end up with puncture wounds and things like that. But again, you know your local environment, you know what the ground conditions are like. And again, are you continuing to work the horse? That is a key factor. Again, unfortunately, in this country, a lot of yards have some form of nasty gravel or hardcore to get over between going from the stable or the field to the ride to the um, outdoor arena or indoor arena, if you're really lucky, okay? Horses don't like walking over that stuff unshot. They feel it and you end up with bruising or even abscessing. So you've got to be a little bit careful. Obviously, there are other options as well. You could have the shoes off and go and buy a pair of rubber boots. Um, again, some horses like the rubber boots, some horses don't. To be honest, I think the trouble is with the rubber boots, certainly in our country, because we have a lot of wet in our country, we have a lot of distorted hoof capsules anyway. We haven't got these nice upright sort of American type feet because of the dry environments over there. So a lot of these hoof boots on the market do struggle to fit some of our horses feet. Um, but if you can find them to fit, you know, they're a great alternative. You can put them on and off yourself. Um, if you are going to continue to work your horse, Again, depends on where you're going to work. If you're going to work it in a school, most horses will actually work on an arena surface perfectly fine. Some even better without shoes on. Um, obviously, we'll be answering just, uh, sorry, obviously a few people are coming on. Obviously, we're going to answer some questions at the end of this because if you ask the questions now, You'll put me off. I'll lose my train of thought. I'm getting on a bit now, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll miss your question. So, yeah, if you if you're not if you are going just riding in the school and your horse can get from the stable or the field to the school comfortable, yeah, you're absolutely fine to go without any shoes on, unless you are dealing with an injury or an ongoing uh, pathological condition or treatment protocol. Okay, but again, your farrier or barefoot trimmer will be the person to ask on that because they know your horse's feet, you know. But the key thing here is, oh, is what you've got to remember, okay, that horse spent its first four years of its life with no shoes on. It coped pretty well at that point. You know, 
Foals, they're born. I know foals are a lot, a uh, lot smaller and a lot lighter than they grow in to be, but their feet are a lot softer and a lot smaller too. They seem to cope okay with no shoes. Wild horses. They spend their life eating on the plains of some faraway place, being hunted down by lions and tigers, etc. They seem to cope fine too. So I'm sure your 15 hand cob with nice big solid feet will cope as well. Trimming cycle, just a quick one is a lot of people do think that by taking your shoes off, you are technically making it that you will have less frequent um visits by the farrier that's a bit of a false economy really because if you are going to keep your feet balanced i mean take the shoes off your horse and it's walking around its paddock it's not really causing a lot of wear and tear and again it depends on the environment and the time of year it might not wear itself at all okay so if you are having the shoes off, you will still technically need to see your farrier as often as you would if it got the shoes on. Again, I've I've heard one of the things I used to hear a lot from barefoot trimmers was they used to want to trim every four to five weeks, which for most people is a lot more frequent than you actually see your farrier when he shoes it. So don't think for one minute but if you have your shoes taken off, that means you need to see your farrier less. Some horses can go a little bit longer uh, without doing any harm to themselves. But in an ideal world, you should be trimming as, as often as you're shearing. Because, again, horses don't, unless they're doing a lot of work in a school or even going down the road once in a while, they're not actually wearing their feet down that much. Um, so... You know, again, that's a bit of a false thing. The one thing you are going to reduce on is those emergency call call out where the horse has pulled a shoe off. And like a, like I say, you can go over the six week shearing cycle without shoes on, without causing as much damage to the horse. But to keep that foot perfectly trimmed, you still need to kind of trim it the same amount. So lastly, just talking about the advice out there remember this is a rapidly changing situation you know we've all seen this weekend that although they've been saying for the last week not to go out the weather's going to be nice but stay at home do what you've been doing no some people still saw it it's the weekend so they can do what they want and if they want to go and sit on brighton beach and eat fish and chips then that's what they're going to do so there is every every chance that the lockdown situation will get worse Okay, so that might mean people, I mean, I, I personally do believe that farriers will still be able to go out and carry out hoof care. We might have to relook at our strategies for des deciding what needs shearing and what doesn't need shearing and stuff. Um, but I do think that will be left for us to decide. Um, obviously, like I keep saying, your farrier, your hoof care provider and your vet are the best people to advise you on your individual case. Not what you've read on some internet forum, not what I've said or anything else. They know your horse, they've got it covered. Okay. Um, key thing is some people are still carrying on riding. Um, I think, I know in discussions I've had, I've, I've, I've seen a lot of people hacking out recently. Again, some people are going, well, they shouldn't be, you know, we should be seen to be doing the right thing. But at the end of the day, it's like going out on a bike ride. You could fall off and seriously hit, hurt yourself. You could hit a pothole. Your horse could get spooked. But if you know your horse and you know it's safe of houses and you feel that you're in your comfort zone, then that's your decision. I'm certainly not going to judge you for doing whatever but again we could end up being locked down further and then that will all have to stop you know i know in some countries they completely banned all forms of horse riding etc um just because of this risk of overstretching hospital beds with people falling off their horses but again we're not there yet um just remember with all this whether you take the shoes off or not 
we are entering entering this kind of perfect storm for laminitis this this year. You know, just just the actual warm, wet weather uh, winter we've just had, and the fact that now everything's growing at, at Mach nine. Uh, uh, an incredible rate. I mean, I've had to mow my lawn twice in the last 10 days. <clears throat> you know, that and the fact that these horses all of a sudden are not doing as much work, you know, you've you've got to do the right thing. And again, if your horse has had a pre-existing um, bout of laminitis, that doesn't necessarily mean that it can't have its shoes off, you know. What we do to horses which get laminitis nine times out of ten is we put some form of heart bar shoe on it. The heart bar shoe basically replicates, it's, it's the only shoe we've got which replicates the unshod horse because everything is, is supported underneath the foot, whereas normally on a normal shoe, it's a thin strip of metal going from heel to heel, all you're doing is supporting a hoof wall. Well, the unshod horse, everything's on the ground bearing weight, especially the frog. So that's all the heart bar shoe does. So actually, the unshod horse has more support to that foot than the shod horse does have. So again, even if your horse has had laminitis before, um, you know, it might be better off without the shoes on, unless it's had um, a serious bout of laminitis where we've had what we call foundering, where the, the bone just dropped inside the foot, and that distance between the sole and the foot isn't as as far as it should be. I did see one of my clients in this chat room tonight. I know her mare had a quite bad bout last year, and that pedal, that tip of that pedal bone or P3 is literally millimeters away from the sole. She wouldn't cope very well, or she wouldn't cope without the shoe, normal shoes on, just to lift that off, give her some ground clearance. So again. It depends on the individual case, but your farrier, your vet, your hoof care provider will be able to um, tell you. And, and lastly, really, just be advised. There is a lot of bad advice and fake news out there. I'm seeing stuff all the time on my Facebook feed saying this um, equine federation said you should, shouldn't be doing this. Another one's advised you to go and do it. Okay, use common sense. Not everything you see on social media is the truth. Um, I did see last week, and it kind of went, started to go a little bit viral. Someone thought for a joke, because it was April Fool's Day, that they'd post something saying that DEFRA had announced that all horses were to have their shoes removed. It was a farrier. It was quite unprofessional. Um, yeah, caused, caused a bit of um, anger within the industry, um, but it all got sorted out. So just be careful what you, what you um, read on social media, you know, some of the advice, I know people have a burning question, so they put it on, they Google the answer or they put it in to some equine forum, um, you know, and the answer you get back isn't always necessarily the right one. You know, speak to the people who know your horse and your situation. That's the key thing. Now then, has anyone got any questions? I'll keep this open for a couple more minutes while I go and check my pork in the oven. Right, so I have a question there from Trish. Um, so if I have a five-year-old doing nothing with COVID, then that's fine. What, to take his shoes off? If it's not doing anything? Again, I don't know your horse, Trish. I, know, I knew your old horse, but I don't know this horse. Depends on its feet. Speak to your farrier, best person to advise you. Has it got any pre-existing problems? Has it got an orthotic device or a surgical shoe on, which is doing a job? That's the answer, really. Someone else, Bex Robertson, she's put diet, question mark, question mark. Well, I know I need to go on a diet. Um, the lockdown diet is not really working for me. But yeah, again, <sighs> Your horse 
if it's having its shoes off and going out in the field, really it, 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 it's being fed, you know, it, it stood in grass. Adding anything to the diet, and I did say that earlier, I mean, most, most feet, most poor conditioned feet having the shoes take off, will the condition after that transitional period will normally, the condition of the feet will normally get better. You know, the last thing you really want to do, I mean, this time of year, you want to be reducing the amount of feed your horse is eating, going into the laminitis season. I know some horses have come out the winter looking well. Some horses have come out, quite frankly, clinically um, obese, which, you know, they certainly want their food reducing, um, you know, which may form strip grazing using muzzles, stuff like that. And I know some horses, I mean, our, our old broodmare, God bless her, she's come out of the winter. I mean, she's an old girl now. She's been out all winter. She's had hay when necessary and she's been out in the fields. But yeah, she she's lost a bit of, she's got good condition, but she's certainly lost a bit of weight. But that's great because I know in the next two weeks, that's going to that's gonna go on her like Kate does at Christmas, you know. Well, say if, if anyone else has got any more questions, obviously this this live stream we've just done, it will um, eventually end up on the um, Hovis page where you can waz for it at your leisure, you know, fast forward the boring bits. Um, if you do think of any questions you want to ask, just pop them in the comments below. Alternatively, you can private message me on Facebook and, you know, I will get back hopefully give you an answer if I can. Um, obviously, tomorrow night, I'm doing the talk on laminitis. Um, all I will say on that, obviously the one on laminitis tomorrow night, this isn't a kind of like beginner's guide to laminitis or anything like that. The talk tomorrow night is purely and simply why we are we getting more laminitis cases now than we used to get you know taking it bearing in, bearing in mind there's a lot more horses now than there used to be but you know the actual percentile of that you know us as far as a deal of a lot more repeat cases of laminitis than we used to um and things like veterinary science farrier science everything else and even farrier training and everything, all the external factors have got better, but why, why are we getting more and more cases year in, year out? That's, that's the aim of the discussion tomorrow night. Um, you know, it was, it was a presentation I gave at a local riding club last year. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's one of these food for thought, food for thought kind of discussions, you know, because let's face it, the main person who has the maximum impact on that horse on day to day, basis is yourself okay um so that's that's the aim of the talk tomorrow night uh becky longhurst you've just said i have a horse with collateral ligament damage on both fronts he is sound and in light work Shh. could he possibly cope on shot again the specifics of that case again what surface you're working on that's the massive um factor in that but again, your farrier and your vet are the ones dealing with this. And also they are the ones as well who have got to pick up the pieces when things go back to normal. So could it, could it cope? Um, depends whether it's just got normal shoes or it's got some kind of orthotic device, remedial shoes on it. Um, but certainly, Certainly, if it's got normal shoes on, other than the actual um, rigidity of the shoe might be providing to the shearing forces of the hoof capsule, probably could. But again, was a was a lot of different factors there. You'd really have to speak to your um, farrier, your vet over that. Um, Mm. 
Um, Victoria, Victoria M. Carpenter Rook. Um, again, this is a problem which does keep coming up. There's a lot of people's. I, I am hearing stories. I mean, again, I've, I've spoke to a lot of different farriers out there. Some are some are being careful where they go. Some some are just cracking on as normal. Um, not many. Um, some are sort of shoeing as normal, but taking precautions, which you know, which is great. Um, but some people, especially due to their family commitments, and like you know, there are a lot of older farriers, um, or you know, not necessarily older farriers, but there uh, are farriers out there with pre-existing health conditions and they are in the at-risk category. Um, I think, you know, and that's down for them. If they don't, if they, if they want to not risk it and not come out and not shoe horses, then, you know, you have got the option to try and find someone who will shoe the horse, you know, I think you keeping your horses with the um, with their historic issues on a five to six week cycle is perfect. Um, but at the end of the day, if you go up six to seven, I do think that you know you could be um, you know you are you are putting all that hard work you've put into that horse to get it right. You are putting that at risk. And unfortunately, the only the only thing to do if your far is dead certain that he's not going to do it, then you may have to find someone who will do it. You know, certainly whilst this this uh, crisis is, is going on, um, you know, it's just one of those things. You know, and this is one of the main reasons why farriers have been able to carry on to to a degree working because you know it's like if we. If this horse needs shoeing every six weeks, but we'll go an extra week, that extra week, then it does then become what we class as an emergency or an urgent case. So, I mean, I, I personally went out the other day, I've got a horse a bit like these cases, which needs doing on a five to six week cycle. It's got special bar shoes on its feet because it's got very, very collapsed, distorted feet. And it has, and it's a like, long history of suspension, uh, sorry, sensory uh, desmitis, et cetera. Um, and you know he he does need doing because and I know and I know the the lady who owns it is carrying on riding it because she's lucky enough to have stables in an arena at home. Um, but then she's got her other horse there, so obviously when I go out to do that, I'm already at the yard. Um, so I'm going to shoot the other horse. So again, everyone's doing their own thing, but. If you've got a horse and it does need chewing and you think that it needs chewing and your vet who you use has advised that it needs chewing at that time time frame, then if your farrier can't come out to do it because he's self-isolating or he's he's only doing what he classes as urgent, then you've got to have that conversation with him and then you'll just have to make alternative arrangements. Well, say so if anyone else got any more questions, just leave them in the comments below once this has um, appeared back up online, um, and I will try and answer them. You know, but again, the general thing here is common sense and speak to your hoof care provider. You know, again, there's a lot of people uh, doing things differently with what's going on at the moment, um, but you know, you know, and that, that's you know. That's all there is to really say on it. But I mean, the key, key point tonight, will your horse cope without shoes? Like I say, just remember, the ones in the world don't have shoes and yours didn't for the first sort of three to four years. So, key, you know, the other key factor is with the current situation, we don't know how long it's going to last for, but Oh, one last question. Just, uh, just to answer Haley from New Zealand's question, 
boots boots are great for being ridden in what you do tend to find with rubber boots if you're turning out in them is that they actually do make the feet quite sweaty and moisture gets trapped in the boot and it won't come out and um because the feet will sweat and produce moisture as well and the actual feet will become a lot softer um you know it's it's a difficult one like i say is i do find with a lot of these thoroughbreds with soft flat feet there is a transitional period and, and theirs is a bit more touchy anyway but it's i do yeah i mean i've not come across many thoroughbreds like that which didn't actually end up long term with better feet because I, an old pharaoh when i when i was an apprentice he said to me that one of the reasons they do end up better feet is if they do go a bit foot sore that creates inflammation in the foot and therefore um increased blood supply to the foot increase in nutrition actually it will start to grow a lot more foot you know um horses are great compensators like that so sometimes i mean and i've had this before with thoroughbreds with poor feet where we've got to the point where we can't economically keep a shoe on it because it's it just pulls shoes off for fun the whole time it needs support and a bit of width for length but then it pulls them off and it's done that much damage to the foot you've got no option but to take it off the first couple of weeks the horse has been quite unlevel walking around in this paddock and we've given it pain uh, sort of like um butte or some other kind of of pain relief and just kind of ignored it and after that period of time the, the lameness has gone and what we've got 12 weeks later really really the best feet that horse is it started having shoes on um karen welcome to the party if you play this lecture back and watch it then you, i would have answered that and you just ask me to repeat myself you know my dinner's in the oven um but yeah play it back karen it's all on there right anyway i have to go and cook for my family now um i hope this has been used to some of you um and again remember obviously we're going to talk a bit about laminitis tomorrow night um thanks for tuning in